um, the time just flies in. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully you will have already done the other sessions that we've done. So um, the other modules, we will have a bit of a recap of those now as we go through. Just gonna make this big. Um, and yeah, so like, you know, we have focused on the importance of the holistic approach to health throughout the, the you know, the modules that we've done. Um, so that filters through to our lifestyle habits also. Um, and I want to explore these more throughout this session, um, along with everyday tips and tricks uh, to help you support um, these lifestyle changes and some healthy eating habits that will feed into that. Um, so yeah, um, always, you know, uh, the aim is to support you to overcome uh, your everyday nutrition challenges and obstacles. And that's, you know, something that uh, we have, oh, sorry, hold on one second. I think I've got, yeah. Can you still see that okay? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Jade, I forgot to say to you, sorry, at the start, if we can just finish for five to 12, and um, there's yeah. no meeting in the Zoom diaries today. Sorry, just about that. So no, that's... no worries. All good. Um, yeah, so the aim is to support you to overcome your everyday nutrition challenges and obstacles. So that's something we're focusing on always throughout these sessions. Um, and this is something I reminded you of at the start, and I just wanted to caveat, you know, this session to say that that's how we're, you know, always going to approach things. So uh, just remembering that, uh, you know, these are the four modules that we had been working on. These are the four cornerstones of uh, nutrition and lifestyle change that I see to be, uh, you know, most important uh, that we have these in place before we move on to other things. Like if you're not drinking enough water or managing your caffeine or managing your hydration, then it's really difficult to move on and do more things on top of that. So that's why it's really important for us to have these foundations laid with these fundamentals. So then we can continue to move on and build on these as we um, you know, kind of work through them. Um, and obviously we talked a lot about that toxic load which is mostly the intake of processed foods um how we can and it's not saying we don't have processed foods like you know always the 80 20 approach it's right we're going to have them 20 percent of the time and really enjoy them or even less than 20 percent of the time whatever works for you um and you know just crowd out that processed food with more whole foods um replenishing with our you know our uh fruit, vegetables, whole grains, meat, fish, all of those good quality dairy, all of those things. And then today, obviously, we will be touching more on our managing stress and sleep. Um, so, uh, you know, that is going to be something that uh, you will have a lot better idea about uh, after we go through the session today. So, um, yeah. Also, if any of you have been working on any of the you know, the life um, style, the, the nutrition habits and uh, changes that we were incorporating from week one, like your water diary, increasing your water, your caffeine curfew, um, you know, also uh, our food diary or the, you know, keeping an eye on how many different colors of fruit, veg, etc. Just pop a note in the comments, just if you're happy to do that and let me know how it's been going, if it has been useful for you, if you've noticed any positive changes with it, I'd be really interested to know, um, yeah, how you're getting on with that. So, um, you know, basically the modern world that we live in exposes us to lots of stressors, uh, you know, less rest, we're constantly trying to get the most out of our time, you know, more noise, more information. We're constantly connected to our phones, laptops, and TVs without switching off. More toxins, like we had already touched on. Um, you know, also sometimes it can be reduced support networks. You know, a lot of people experienced that over the pandemic. Uh, so, you know, what we want to try and do is get a balance of uh, surviving the modern lifestyle, and also supporting our body, nourishing it, uh, and allowing us to function uh, 
in an optimal way without being overly stressed and wired. So some issues that we face are that a lot of us are stressed and we might not even realize that we're stressed or we might not know what is causing us to be stressed. So on another note, a lot of us don't want to admit that we are stressed. So whether we admit that we are stressed or not, our bodies will speak the truth with symptoms of physical or mental ill health. So some typical, typical symptoms of suppressing stress can include things like sleep disturbances, um, you know, which can range from general mild sleep disturbances to more chronic sleep issues like insomnia or narcolepsy. Um, you know, mood disorders like anxiety, depression, OCD, and an array of other mental health conditions, headaches, migraines, digestive issues, things like reflux, IBS, ulcers, upset stomach, and many other symptoms and conditions, uh, you know, also can present as a loss of appetite, or on the flip side could be food cravings. We could experience low energy, fatigue, inability to relax, really. Uh, memory and concentration issues, including brain fog. So this list is quite exhaustive. And these are simply just a few examples to give you a general idea. Also, uh, you know, we're not just saying that stress is the only thing that causes or drives these symptoms or conditions, but it is something that we want to be mindful of. And it is something that we can, you know, make some changes to help support that. Um, just going to see somebody's written under the chat. That's probably my comment. Was okay. It? Yeah, <laughs> I, you've, you've been drinking more water, and the, I know the heat definitely does encourage to drink more water. Um, and like you said, you've got lemon, and I'm trying to jazz it up so it's more refreshing. Uh, which is. Is that yeah. then, Tia? If it is obviously hot, hotter weather, then you really should be drinking more water. Like it's. Um, yeah like you definitely want to stay hydrated like you want like the, the kind of water intake we talked about before two and a quarter liters for female three for men like if you are maybe doing you know more high intensity movement or you're sweating a lot like what I would say you would do is add electrolytes to that water to make sure you're retaining the you know the hydration from the water and um, one way you can do that is by what you've just said, you added some lemon to your water that would add some electrolytes to it. Um, we talked about like adding electrolytes before through like a pinch of sea salt, um, you know, some uh, citrus, um, even some ginger would also do that. So that can help us to um, remain, uh, retain our electrolyte balance, even if we're sweating a lot and, you know, losing more fluid than usual. So that would be a good way to make sure you stay hydrated also. But yeah, good work. So yeah, basically, this is uh, just a bit of an explanation around your fight or flight versus our rest and digest. And uh, I'm not sure if you might have heard of fight or flight before, maybe might not have heard of rest and digest before, but I'll just explain these a bit more for you now. So basically, when we're in a state of stress, our bodies operate from our fight or flight mode. So that is known as our sympathetic nervous system response. Uh, you know, basically this results in decreased muscular activity in the digestive system because our body is focused on redirecting our blood flow and oxygen to other parts of the body. Like the heart, for example, they allow you to pump more blood around the body in preparation for, you know, fighting or flighting from that perceived danger that you've recognized. So that's fine if you're in a situation where, you're getting mugged or you need to make a quick exit or you need to, you know, just flee from the situation. But we don't want to be in that response when we are sitting at home relaxing, if we're at work, even just kind of, you know, relaxing with the kids or, you know, do fulfilling whatever your day-to-day -day responsibilities are. So the exact opposite of fight and flight is our rest or rest and digest response, which is known as our parasympathetic nervous system response. Rest and digest encourages uh, peristalsis, which is movement through our um, digestive system and our gut, moves the food through our gut and our digestive system. It also encourages the secretion of digestive juices, which is something that supports digestion, 
It also allows us to absorb more nutrients in the food and benefit from them within our body's different organ systems. So, um, you know, from this short description, I hope it allows you to see how over a long period of time, chronic stress can result in chronic digestive issues and also other chronic health conditions. So, um, you know, all the things that we're talking about today and managing stress and sleep are aimed at moving us away from a constant fight or flight response and moving more towards a rest and digest response. And there are things that we can do that can allow us um, to, you know, get the balance right with these two, um, these two responses in the body. So hopefully that makes sense. And, you know, stress in the body can be driven by a process known as inflammation. Inflammation is basically something that we want to keep to a minimum in the body. A lot of the things that drive inflammation in the body can also contribute to physical and mental stress. So we've already discussed some of these things in detail, such as an ultra-processed diet that's high in refined carbs, you know, refined sugars, processed foods, and chemical additives that contribute to inflammation and also have a negative impact on our gut bacterial balance. You know, that's something that we've talked quite a lot about. Another driver of inflammation can include some prescription and non-prescription medications, such as antibiotics and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, because they can, uh, you know, they can give our digestive system a bit of a rough time. So I'm by no means encouraging not to take medications and you always need to consult with your doctor before you know changing your medications but there is 100% a time and a place for them to be used but if we misuse them or consume them in excess then that's when we will you know have a detrimental effect on inflammation in the gut and also on our gut bacterial balance. So you may remember pre-COVID, the NHS, it's, it's quite hard to remember like pre-COVID because everything's just related to COVID these days, but the NHS had previously had advertising campaigns where they would advise to only take antibiotics when necessarily. So that is because antibiotics are really good at doing their job of wiping out the bad bacteria. Absolutely. But they also take out the good bacteria. So this is why it's important to do things like increase your intake of probiotic foods when you're taking antibiotics or take an, you know, a probiotic supplement when you are on antibiotics to help replenish that gut flora that's getting wiped out with the antibiotic. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs also provide a great temporary solution to reducing symptoms of pain and inflammation, but they don't get to the root cause of the issue. So what I would say with these is obviously if you're in pain and you need to take them, take them. But are there other means of getting to the root cause of the pain that you can, you know, make yourself maybe go to a physio, maybe go to an osteopath. If it's, if it's a sore back or whatever, you know, osteopath, physio, you know, movement, stretching, yoga. Like, are there other things that you can do to make sure that you're not having to depend on this medication long term? Because it will have a detrimental effect on the gut. So. It's just a gentle reminder to take medications responsibly and mindfully. Um, so also um, referring to our gut bacteria, our guts are made up mostly of bacteria. We actually have more bacterial cells in our body than actual human cells, which is ideally how it should be. The problem is when the bad organisms outnumber the good. So we want to avoid an imbalance in parasites, yeasts, fungal overgrowths, which will then steal essential nutrients that we, that we require and wreak havoc on our health. So when in abundance, the good bacteria will help us to absorb and retain nutrients more efficiently and contribute to good overall health. So, uh, you know, there's actually, I actually do a full module on, you know, gut health and um, like it's something that you could talk about all week it's so diverse so um, there's there's so many topics that you could delve into with that um, and stress like we've talked about with the fight or flight response you know chronic stress also suppresses the immune system so you know immune function is something we've all been massively focused on over the past few years and something that we want to optimize so 
when the immune system is suppressed, it can contribute to parasite, yeast, bacterial, viral, fungal, you know, overgrowth in the body. So, you know, that's also another reason why it's so important for us to manage our stress. Um, you know, also keeping in mind that in times of stress, a lot of people are more inclined to make poor dietary choices, sugary, processed, fast foods, to give quick bursts of energy that then result in quick crash and burn. So it's that, you know, whatever goes up must come down. So when we're spiking our blood sugars really quickly, getting that quick, fast burst of energy through sugar, through sweets, through fuzzy drinks, whatever it is, we will get that head of energy, but we'll crash. So that's why you can, you know, feel that you can be on a roller coaster of chasing that energy throughout the day. Maybe it's through caffeine, maybe it's through sugar, you know, uh, whatever foods that you're putting into your body. So we want to get our energy on a more even key because of that. And that's why it's important that we're making the right food choices around times, particularly of stress. Um, quickly going to tell you a quick story about a previous client of mine. So Paul and her Sally, it's not a real name, uh, she was in her 20s and had a chronic sleep condition called narcolepsy. So um, Sally was on medications provided by the drop doctor that helped to reduce her episodes of drowsiness. So she was experiencing extreme fatigue and low energy levels. It was affecting her ability to concentrate and work and to perform to the best of her ability. So this resulted in a lot of anxious feelings, a lot of stress. She was also having extreme brain fog, uh, which um, was having difficulty remembering simple everyday information. She was health conscious. She was trying her best to eat well. Her downfall was sugary treats and snacks. So this made sense because the sugar would give her quick, fast bursts of energy. However, as we know, when we're consuming the wrong type of sugars, it will lead to faster energy crash. So the sudden burst of energy wouldn't last long for Sally and she would feel awful after she had these foods. It would also bring on sleep episodes for her. So obviously she had a more chronic sleep condition, but it was triggering sleep episodes throughout the day and, you know, in the evening time for her. Um, so uh, she wasn't consuming much caffeine, um, although she, she wasn't drinking enough water either. Um, so basically, quick update on Sally. Um, what we did uh, was uh, we identified some of her intolerances that were driving some of her allergies that she was having. Um, we worked on a plan to manage and eliminate these for her. We also worked on removing the refined sugars and processed foods that she was craving. So we gave her some healthier sugar options for her diet, including dark chocolate, apples and almond butter, things like dates and almond butter. We also worked on increasing green leafy veggies in her diet, which are packed full of magnesium and help to support the nervous system and to produce good quality sleep at night. So we also had a strict, strict prescription of sleep hygiene, um, which you will learn more about as we go throughout the session today. So within a few months, she had a lot more energy than she did previously. She was only really feeling tired at night when she was going to bed. Her sleep at night had also improved and resulted in her waking up feeling more refreshed. So this meant that she was a lot more productive at work and was not experiencing anxiety on the level that she had been throughout the day. She also seen a massive increase in her number of orders she was able um, to complete in her job. So her brain fog had lifted substantially. She was able to remember things a lot easier than she had before. So the main point of this story is that nutrition and lifestyle change made a massive positive impact on this lady who had a chronic sleep condition. If she had given up and thought there was no point in trying to feel better because she had a diagnosis of an incurable chronic condition, then she would never realize that she could feel as good as what she does now. So even though you might think that your sleep is a lost cause or it's something, you know, or even symptoms that you have, there is always something that can be done with it. So um, I would say, you know, just keep this in mind. Um, and yeah, um, it's just a quick example of, you know, how massive changes can be made through things that you might think are quite small and might not have that big an impact. So moving on, uh, 
let's get started on everything that we can do within our lifestyle to support reduction of stress, starting with sleep. You know, I think we all know that getting good quality sleep is important, but how many of us actually sleep well? Like whenever I do in-person workshops, I would say 80, 90% of people say that they don't sleep well. And when I say sleep well, I mean being able to fall asleep easily, not waking throughout the night and waking up feeling refreshed. So we want to support sleep because it's so important for lots of bodily processes. It helps to maintain energy levels, support metabolism, and also support weight management. So our circadian rhythm regulates our natural sleep-wake cycles, depending on hormones produced as a result of responses to light and dark. So simplistically, our sleep hormone melatonin is secreted when it starts to get dark, and our wake hormone cortisol is secreted in the brighter waking hours. This is why our circadian rhythm is affected by how much time we spend in natural light and by our exposure to artificial light. So even considering back in the day, 75% of the population worked outdoors and now only 10% of the population work in natural daylight. Most of us in the Northern Hemisphere are stuck at a desk or working inside without access to much natural light, especially now that a lot of us are working from home. Now, uh, well, obviously that will depend on the type of work that you are doing, but also add to the max use of phones, TVs, laptops, and smart devices, along with artificial lighting. It's a recipe for a really muddled up circadian rhythm. Also considering the poor weather and low temperatures can have detrimental effects on circadian rhythm. So everybody, you know, based in Ireland and the UK, we're basically not blessed with a lot of luck whenever it comes to weather. I know it's probably been a bit better recently than what we're used to, but definitely something to keep in mind. You know, in the months where it is darker, um, when we do need to um, kind of think on how we can support our sleep cycles properly. So some tips to support a balanced circadian rhythm include, so basically the concept of sleep hygiene, so unfortunately, it's not as easy as just making sure you're always nice and clean before you go to bed, if only it was so easy. Um, although a top sleep consultant, Tom Coleman, recommends that having a warm shower before bed activates a rebound cooling response in the body, which triggers an increase in our sleep hormone melatonin, which can help you to sleep better. So we're not talking an absolutely, you know, boiling hot shower like a nice lukewarm, like warm temperature. Um, so that is something that you could, you know, put under your uh, nighttime routine. So sleep hygiene can be supported by building on some new behaviors around your sleep. So any client that I work with privately is given a prescription of sleep hygiene. Some people can adapt it quite easily. Some people find it quite difficult. So it just depends. Um, if you find it difficult, work on, you know, what is an, a low hanging fruit, what's easy to do, um, and then kind of the more difficult behaviors, you can continue to build on them. One of the things that people find most difficult is limiting screen time before bed. So our bodies will not begin to produce that sleep hormone melatonin until we reduce or remove sources of artificial light to allow that wind down period before sleep. So we're talking electronic devices, TVs, laptops, phones, um, you know, one hour before bed, you know, a lot, if you can do one hour, longer than one hour, amazing. Um, you know, if you think you'll struggle with an hour, start off with 30 minutes, then build it up. It's all about progress, not aiming for perfection. So it's better to start, you know, generally um, cutting off that springtime as long as you can before bed, but, uh, you know, 15 minutes, half an hour is better than no minutes. So uh, it's better to do it that way. The longer before bed you can do it, like I said, better. You can also look at the blue light block and glasses that can help with this. But I would say still having that hour, you know, uh, no screen time before bed is really important. And, you know, believe it or not, there are things that we can do that don't involve TV, laptop, phone um, before we go to bed, you know, reading, um, some people just like to have, you know, a nice routine, maybe for their skincare, maybe a bath, maybe a shower, um, things like 
crosswords, word searches, even like an audiobook, or if you have a nice podcast, things like that, you can download podcasts. So it means that you don't have to be on your Wi-Fi or on your phone. Um, you know, just play it until it ends and, and that's it. Uh, just finding what works for you in this time is really important. Everybody's different. Um, so yeah, just just do what works for you in that time that allow you to look forward to that time. Some people like journaling. It just really depends on your preference. Uh, so also, like I said, uh, obviously light has got a big impact on our sleep cycle. So a dimly lit room is important for regulation of sleep hormones. So like in this time of the year where it's quite bright, like, you know, until late at night and early in the morning, total block out blinds, preventing, you know, earlier waking or even trying to go to bed at night. Temperature is also very important to our sleep cycles. When we get too warm, it disrupts our sleep. So like at this time of the year, I would say switch to, you know, like your summer duvet, not the same really thick duvet as what you would have in the winter time, maybe just lighter sheets. Um, also, you know, even in the colder months, if you do tend to have the heaters and the radiators on in the bedroom, I would say, you know, turn those off. Um, it is best to have a cool environment in your bedroom to uh, promote better sleep cycles. Ideal temperature is around 18 degrees Celsius uh, for your bedroom to promote sleep. And on that note, like in the colder months, hot waters, hot water bottles, electric blankets are amazing to keep your room nice, your bed nice and toasty. Maybe best not to sleep with them throughout the night. Let, you know, have, use them to heat up the bed and then remove them. Caffeine, we've talked about in quite a bit of detail, but we know that caffeine is a stimulant for our fight or flight nervous system response. It's also something that, you know, can take up to 12 hours for us to metabolize. If you feel like your sleep is disrupted, look at your caffeine intake, go back and look at your caffeine curfew. So, so important. Um, but I'm not going to dwell on that too much because we've covered it already in quite a bit of detail. <clears throat> so our body loves to be in a routine. It's very habitual. Um, having a set time for sleep each night um, and a set time for waking in the morning is uh, really beneficial for our circadian rhythm. Um, you know, especially important if you do any type of shift work, you know, you should aim to have set times to sleep and wake around a shift pattern, especially if you're doing night shift. Um, really important to um, have a routine with that. Some simple things you can do is have an eye mask. It's going to block out the, you know, the brightness. Earplugs is going to make it nice and quiet, um, reducing the light and noise with both of these. So they are quite easy things that you can do to promote sleep. Avoiding sedatives is also strongly recommended. So regular use of sleeping pills and other sedatives to aid sleep are not recommended. They can lead to dependency and addiction. Also includes the use of alcohol to help you fall asleep. Although it can promote the onset of sleep, it is associated with earlier awakenings, disrupted sleep, and poor quality sleep. So if you do want to enjoy a glass of wine or beer, it's recommended to leave a two-hour gap between your last drink and bedtime. So please just remember, you know, drinking uh, responsibly within government guidelines is also really important. So vitamin D is really important to support our physical and mental health, in particular D3, cholecalciferol, most bioavailable and highly absorbable form in the body. So we require vitamin D <coughs> for a lot of bodily functions, including the support of bone health to reduce inflammation and to regulate the immune system. But it's also a building block of those neurotransmitters such as serotonin that can contribute to our direct feelings of well-being. So the best way to get vitamin D is through sun exposure. So this time of the year, we're having a bit more of that now. Recommended sun exposure is 30 minutes a day. It does vary with pigment of skin, sunscreen use, and clothes coverage. So, you know, a lot of the research is done on full body um, exposure to vitamin D. Not a lot of people are outside walking around in their swimming trunks or their bikinis. So that can be quite subjective. But we do want to take into consideration the strength of the sun's rays. Um, this part, you know, in this part of the world, uh, spring and summer, definitely, um, you know, we've got stronger um, rays coming from the sun. Autumn and winter time, not so much. 
um, it's a lot more difficult to get our recommended daily allowance through sun exposure. We can get some vitamin D through foods such as oily fish, liver, eggs, and butter, but they're quite small amounts. We do also get it in mushrooms. Um, one little tip with mushrooms is if you get, if you buy mushrooms, leave them on your windowsill to absorb uh, some vitamin D from the sun and it can increase your intake of vitamin D through those. So that's a little tip if for anybody who maybe doesn't eat um, meat and wants to get their, you know, their vitamin D through plant-based. Well, you can't really get it all through plant-based sources, but you can boost it a bit like that. Um, so we do recommend supplementation with vitamin D in this part of the world, absolutely, in the autumn and winter months. It is a good idea to get your vitamin D levels checked. Um, you can get tests with uh, your GP. And also there's really quite easy tests that you can do online and they're quite cost effective. That way you'll know your exact you know, levels of vitamin D and the you like recommended daily allowance is a thousand I use a day for vitamin D. Um, but like you might need more, you might need less. It just depends on your own levels. So that's something that you can keep in mind. Moving on to magnesium. So this is essential for energy production. All of the cells in our body require magnesium for the production of ATP which is basically our body's energy currency. So we also require magnesium for muscle contraction and relaxation and to support our nervous system function. So um, for me, this is the mecca of minerals when it comes to supporting uh, stress, nervous system and sleep. It helps to regulate balance moods, sleep, blood pressure, lung function, and immune, immune function. And it is generally low with individuals who eat a highly processed diet. Um, because food sources of uh, magnesium include green leafy vegetables, nuts, seeds, whole grains, lentils and beans. So if you're including lots of these in your you know, everyday diet, then amazing. You are packing it full of magnesium. But if you're not, then it's something you want to be mindful of. Another way we can boost our magnesium intake is through Epsom salt baths. So these are basically magnesium salts. So like in that nighttime routine, a bath for an hour, so sorry, a bath um, for 20 minutes and like medium temperature water, two cups of Epsom salts. You can add, you know, any incense or, you know, like essential oils or whatever you like to add to that. If you don't have a bath or if you don't care to have a bath, you can do the same with a foot bath. So literally a basin, soak your feet, one cup of Epsom salts, it will um, flow into the bloodstream it, through um, the exposure with your feet also. So you can also do that. It's a nice little routine to have in that time uh, when you're switching off with your no screen time. So the vagus nerve uh, is basically the main communication line between our gut and our nervous system and our brain. So when we stimulate the vagus nerve, it encourages our rest and digest nervous system response. So absolutely what we want to encourage. Some things that can include cold water um, therapy. So you might see, you know, a lot of people doing one half or she swimming and stuff like that. That stimulates the vagus nerve. So that's why it can help people with their feelings of well-being, promoting that rest and digest. But if you're not feeling brave enough to go and have a cold water dip in the sea um, or have a lot of cold showers, you can just start off by splashing cold water on your face and wrists. This can help to uh, tap onto that rest and digest response. Or um, there's another concept called havening, um, which is basically just rubbing on the tops of your arms and your face um, and your hands. Um, and that can help to uh, stimulate the vagus nerve. This is also why we get such a relaxing feeling when we pet animals like dogs and cats because it's havening and it's stimulating the vagus nerve stimulation. Um, the ear also has a link to the vagus nerve and can help do relax fight or flight response. So um, gargling and humming and chanting also are linked to that. So that's something you can keep in mind. Uh, Phrenic nerve um, is also really, phrenic nerve stimulation is also important. It's uh, basically just tapping into the regulation of breathing. So breath is so important to help support reduction of stress. 
we can unconsciously hold our breath a lot of the time. So one thing that you can do to stimulate this is take two deep breaths in through your nose consecutively and a large exhale out of your mouth. So basically just... And if you do that, you automatically feel like your shoulders dropping and feeling more relaxed. If you do that for like a minute, it's something that can really help if you find it difficult to fall asleep at night or difficult to switch off. Just tapping into that breathing is something that really helps um, to promote relaxation. So also just being mindful of your environment, you know, fresh air, having some nice plants, maybe lighting candles, uh, you know, nice bright airy rooms whenever you can, um, especially in this time of the year. And the winter, it might be, you know, the concept of hygge, which is, you know, Danish concept of comfort and coziness could be warm lighting candles, the fire, all those things embracing uh, your environment and feeling, you know, just nurtured and that you can enjoy it. Also reminding you that your environment also includes the people that you surround yourself with. So certain relationships can be draining and negative. Sometimes we can't get away from these relationships uh, if it's a family member, for example, but it's always a good idea to protect your energy and manage the time you spend with these people. Relaxation can be whatever this is for you. It doesn't have to be meditation or yoga, which by the way, are actually scientifically proven to increase our anti-anxiety neurotransmitter GABA. But for me, I enjoy cooking. That really helps me to relax. Some people think that's really stressful. So it's about what finding what works for you. Walking, catching up with friends, but do some of that every day. And then exercise, obviously. You know, if you can exercise outdoors, increase your vitamin D absorption, getting out a walk in the morning on the waking hours is a great way to um, support circadian rhythm and sleep cycles. And obviously endorphins produced through exercise are really beneficial. So quickly, I just wanted to talk to you about the blue zones. So you may or may not have heard about the world's blue zones. They're basically the regions of the world where a higher than usual number of people live more than average, longer than average. These regions normally have the most people that live to be over 100 and they're known as centenarians. So if any of you have watched maybe Zac Efron's documentary, Down to Earth on Netflix, he had a really nice one about one of the blue zones in the world, which is Sardinia, uh, an Italian island, home to the highest population of male centenarians that live in one place. Okinawa and Japan were the world's longest loved female is from. And Ikaria and Greece, where residents live eight years longer than Americans, have half the rate of heart disease and almost no dementia. So what do these blue zones do to achieve these long loved healthy lives? Researchers who identified the blue zones believed that their health was a result of their lifestyle and their environment. So another study also identified that only 20% of a person's life expectancy is determined by their genes. So after researching a few pockets of people around the world, researchers identified the blue zones and a list of nine common denominators that they believe contributed to their wellness. So first up is moving naturally. So the world's longest loved people don't take part in strenuous exercise, like a lot of lifting heavyweights or running marathons and things like that. They live in environments that constantly nudge them and they moving without thinking about it. They grow gardens. They don't have, you know, modern electrical equipment for house and garden work and things like that. Um, centenarians all also have a sense of purpose. So the Okinawans um, call it ikigai, which translates to why they wake up in the morning. Knowing your sense of purpose is worth up to seven years of extra life expectancy. So this can reflect as a sense of purpose, however you see fit. It could be with your family, with your community, with your job, um, whatever that is for you. Centenarians also take time out every day to switch off. So like I said, you find what you like to do to relax and do it every day. Um, they do experience stress just like everybody else in the world, but um, you know, basically we want to feed under that reduction of inflammation and chronic stress. So they have routines to shed stress. Uh, Okinawans take a few moments every day to remember their ancestors. Adventists pray 
and Sardinians do happy hour, so they all have a different way to approach it. Um, it just shows the individuality of taking time out and how we can adapt it to our own preference. It has to be personalized and work for you. So they follow an 80% rule. So it's this mantra where they stop eating when their stomachs are 80% full. Um, so it's like the 20% gap um, between not being hungry and feeling full could be the difference between them, you know, uh, maybe contributing to more inflammation or more weight gain. Um, they eat the, normally they eat their smallest meal in the late afternoon or early evening, and they don't really eat much then for the rest of the day. The world's longest lived people also favor plant-based foods. Beans, pulses, and lentils are the cornerstone of most centenarian diets. Meat is eaten on average about five times a month in small palm-sized servings. Now, some of uh, these centenarians do eat mostly plant-based, but um, some of them do include animal-based products. So they also drink added alcohol moderately and regularly. So something the Blue Zone researchers refer to as wine at five. So it applies to all Blue Zones except for the Adventists who they don't drink. So the trick is to drink one to two glasses of wine a day with family and friends um, and with food. Um, and it's not the same as saving it up all throughout the week and having it on one evening. It's, it's a different approach than that. So a lot of them belong to a faith-based community as well. Um, so that's something that a lot of them have in common. And it has been shown in research that it can add between four to 14 years um, to life expectancy. And successful centenarians in the Blue Zones put their families first. So it can be, you know, being around aging parents, grandparents, or, you know, having their children around, their grandchildren, things like that. And finally, the world's longest lived people either choose or were born into social circles that support healthy behaviours. Um, so it's like that thing I talked about, you know, your environment is key and does include the people that you have around you. So um, Okinawans created groups of five friends and committed to each other for life. Um, so I think that's a really nice concept to think of. And research from Framingham studies have shown that smoking, obesity, happiness, and even loneliness are contagious. So suggesting that the social networks of long loved people have favorably shape their behaviors and health basically feeds onto that you know who we're spending time around what they're doing is really important for us so the blue zone team have suggested that most of us have the capacity to make it well into our early 90s mainly without chronic disease um you know as demonstrated by you know all of these uh centenarian groups which i think is just a really interesting thing to keep in mind so a few things quickly that I wanted to touch on that we can do to support our digestive health. So, you know, we talked about how important it is to be in our rest and digest and things like that. So some other things we want to keep in mind is chewing. Digestion starts in the mouth. The, the juices secreted in the mouth and the process of chewing are a key factor in digestion. A process that a lot of us miss out on when we're eating on the go, rushing, eating at our desks. You know, I for one have been guilty of this for a lot of times, um, but I'm not advising you to count the amount of times you chew your food because personally, I feel like that takes the enjoyment out of eating. My advice is to chew your food until it forms a paste-like consistency in your mouth, then swallow. This will help us to, you know, uh, allow our digestion system to break down the food more efficiently so we can absorb the nutrients in the food that we're eating. So also, Focus on eating. There's an old saying proverb, when walking, walk, when eating, eat, which is not true for a lot of us. You know, when is the last time you actually sat down and ate and you weren't on your phone or on TV, watching TV or doing some work? It's just basically encouraging you to focus on enjoying your food when you're eating it. Think about how it tastes, what's the texture, is it sweet, is it salty, are you enjoying it? You know, I know it's not possible. They always eat without distraction from kids, families, work and things like that. But just try to eat more mindfully. Um, allow yourself to enjoy <coughs> the process of tasting your food, savoring it and most importantly, enjoying it. And, you know, always championing a personalized approach to nutrition, health and well-being. You know, 
In 2021, the Institute of Wellness named personalized nutrition as one of its most important health approaches. And that was in the midst of the pandemic. So, you know, everything that we've covered in this program is a good starting point to begin to have awareness about how you're fueling your body and how this can positively or negatively affect your health. So always considering the main pillars that we've already talked about, um, but just do it in a way that works for you. It will take a bit of time. It will take a bit of tweaking, but just keep up with it. It's definitely worthwhile. And enjoy good food, including good quality nutrient dense food is key. Considering food for its nutrient density and the nourishment it gives our body is so much more important than simply just counting calories. Food is something that we want to enjoy as part of our daily routine. Finding the times in the day that work best for us to eat and the foods that we look forward to eating is something that's also very important. I, I for one, uh, just think that food is to be savoured and enjoyed. So definitely enjoy that process. So, you know, always try to stay stocked up with your, you know, replen replenishing with your whole foods, your nutrient dense foods that we've talked about, your healthy snacks and crowd out the processed food as much as possible and enjoy that sporadically rather than as an everyday. Um, so yeah, this week, your final task, which I won't really be able to touch in with you on is sleep hygiene. Um, I'm sure everybody's got behaviors around their sleep that they can tidy up, that, that they can tidy up, that will help you promote better sleep cycles. That will in turn support better energy levels, managing stress levels more effectively, and lots of other positive benefits in the body. So that is all the slides. So five minutes left for any questions that anybody has. Um, these are my contact details. Again, if anybody wants to get in touch, um, you can email me or message me or whatever. Um, happy to answer any questions that you might not feel comfortable asking on here. That is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, sorry, was that someone? Asking a question there? No, I'm just, I think it was me. Yeah. You. I'm just going to stop the recording here if anyone does.